and it's my great pleasure to have organized this panel, Collective Imaginings, Legacies of the Black Audio Film Collective, on the occasion of our exhibition, John Acumfra, Signs of Empire, which will be on view here uh, upstairs until September 2nd. We really are truly so honored um, by the luminary voices who are here uh, as part of the panel tonight and we'll be coming together to discuss the importance of returning to the Black Audio Film Collective's work in our current political and cultural moment, not only in terms of the group's radical approach to documentary film, but also their broader commitment to supporting new voices of color in video production through workshops, roundtable dialogues, and public forums. Um, for those of you who haven't already seen it, I'd encourage you to spend some time in the exhibition upstairs, which is on our second floor. Um, and it includes Expeditions One, Signs of Empire, uh, the first work produced by the collective, along with a number of uh, films and videos by Acomfra. And I should also add that every Wednesday this summer, we're screening four films by the collective. So at 11.30 a.m., there will be the double billing Hansworth songs, followed by Testament. And at 2.30 p.m., uh, seven songs for Malcolm X in The Last Angel of History. So if there's a day this summer that you find yourself in need of air conditioning and uh, video, you know the theater is available for you here. Um, the evening tonight will start with introductory remarks by Ashley Clark, uh, followed by 10-minute presentations from each of the panelists. Uh, the group will talk for a bit, and then we'll open up the conversation for questions from the audience. OK, so let me begin by uh, introducing Ashley Clark over to my the far right. Um, hailing from London and now based in New York, Ashley Clark is the senior programmer of cinema at BAM in Brooklyn. He's also a contributor to publications including Film Comment, Sight and Sound, The Guardian, and Four Columns. His first book is Facing Blackness, Media and Minstrelsy in Spike Lee's Bamboozled. And in March 2018, he curated and presented a retrospective of the Black Audio Film Collective at True False Film Festival in Columbia, Missouri. Uh, please join me in welcoming everyone here. So, um, can you all hear me okay? Yeah? Thank, thank you for coming out. Thank you, Sarah, for the introduction. Um, and I will introduce our esteemed panel uh, in a moment. But I'd like to kick off um, by just setting the scene uh, and reading some introductory remarks uh, from the, the opening chapter of the monograph that I recently wrote um, for the program I curated of Black Audio Film Collective's work. Um, and this is just kind of to set the tone a little bit because the work is, is so rich and dense and our great panel will kind of really get into the nuts and bolts of that. But just to, to give you a flavor of, of, of the, the time that the Black Audio Film Collective emerged um, is what I'm about to hopefully do. So. A, a repressive right-wing authoritarian government, rising xenophobia and nativism, economic recession, seemingly hopeless social polarization, resurgent empire fetishism, a royal wedding like a cherry gingerly placed atop a dumpster fire. Great Britain circa 2018, as it happens, looks a lot like Great Britain circa 1981. That fateful year saw widespread civil unrest and uprising break out across the country, firstly in the South London district of Brixton in the month of April. And while there had been outbreaks of violence uh, in protest of racist policing and mass unemployment stretching back decades, these eruptions marked a national watershed in the sheer scale of disruption. Reports suggested that up to 5,000 people were involved, with over 350 injuries reported, over 100 vehicles burned, and almost 150 buildings damaged, with 28 burned down. Uh, the Conservative Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, I don't say her name lightly, but <laughs> um, blithely dismissed the notion that unemployment and racism had informed the disturbances, stating that nothing but nothing justifies what happened. Her government did, however, commission an investigation culminating in something called the Scarman Report, which concluded that police had become too remote from their communities, that local citizens should have more input into police policymaking, and that police tactics should be more compassionate. Don't know how that turned out. Um, in the aftermath of the unrest, some ground did begin to shift, particularly in the cultural sector. As observed by the historian and writer Kobina Mercer, following Scarman, political expediency or optics 
was a key driver for the bene benevolent gestures of many public institutions who hastily apportioned funding to black focused projects. The unrest resonated, argued Mercer, as an expression of protest against the deep-rooted marginalization of black voices within all aspects of society, and as such, represented a demand for black presence within public institutions as a minimum requirement. Now, culturally, this demand, in part, generated a broad cross-arts flowering of black creative practice, a boom which fortuitously coincided with the birth in 1982 of the independent terrestrial TV station Channel 4, uh, which is still active today. Then it was a very radical new platform. In 1982, Britain only had three terrestrial TV channels. Um, and this fourth one uh, added a, a, a crucial platform for hitherto marginalized filmmakers and audiences alike. Another key development of the era was something called uh, the ACTT Declaration of 1982, which is a really landmark piece of legislation. Um, a little bit of background on that. The, a body called the Independent Filmmakers Association, which was founded in 1974 and was composed of artists, students, and filmmakers, had been pressuring the British Film Institute, the BFI, uh, and the ACTT, which stands for Association of Cinematograph, Television, and Allied Technicians. And it was the main broadcast union, um, which at the time had vast industry bargaining power. Um, they'd been petitioning them for years to make exceptions to union rules and provide some financial security and thus breathing space for the independent creative sector. Now, Channel 4's presence um, as a guaranteed home for new independent content proved a crucial turning point in negotiations, uh, and the ensuing legislation helped to guarantee funding um, for many groups working on politically uh, progressive and formally adventurous uh, filmmaking, including Chedo, uh, Sankofa Film and Video, of which Isaac Julian uh, was a founder member, uh, and the All Asian Group, Retake, uh, to both consolidate their activities and provide opportunities for others through funded outreach and training schemes in addition to creating work. Now, another group who benefited from the declaration went by a stately, unambiguous, and memorable moniker, Black Audio Film Collective, which is why we're here. Um, now, there had been glimmers of independent black British film uh, crafted in a largely realist vein uh, in the UK in the 60s and 70s by the pioneering likes of Horace Ovi and Lloyd Record, and I do recommend you check out their work if you can. But it's fair to say that British moving image culture had seen very little like Black Audio Film Collective uh, when it burst onto the scene in 1982. Having joined forces at Portsmouth Polytechnic University um, before relocating to a studio space in Hackney, East London, uh, this group of seven multimedia artists and thinkers, John Acumfra, Lena Gopal, Rhys Auguiste, Edward George, Avril Johnson, Trevor Matheson, and Claire Joseph, who in 1985 was replaced by David Lawson, uh, came from backgrounds in psychology, fine art, sociology, and cultural studies, and they organized programs of avant-garde and international fiction and non-fiction cinema, and created and exhibited their own work using video, film, and slide tape texts, often in combination. Um, inspired by Stuart Hall and Gramsci, as much as avant-garde filmmakers like Vertov and Jarman, Black Audio Film Collective's work blended cascading montage and complex sonic experimentation with personal reflections on race, memory, post-colony, and migration, and the rigorous yet non-didactic interrogation of official state-sanctioned national histories pertaining to such matters. The group's official debut, uh, exhibition, exped Expeditions One, excuse me, Signs of Empire from 1983, uh, used a Kodak Dissolve unit to fashion a variety of images, some hopeful, some very distressing, into a haunting narrative that was augmented by amplified shards of political oration, found sounds, and pulverizing dub reggae. Uh, from the very beginning, uh, Black Audio Film Collective made a virtue of authorial polyvocality uh, versus a singular authorship. Uh, formal cross-fertilization and the simultaneously disorienting and clarifying power of montage. And what's more, they clearly expected their audience to do a little bit of work. Um, Black Audio Film Collective possessed a unique style and hybrid identity, which is vividly described by Kojo Eshin of the Otolith Group, uh, the group's associate and co-biographer. And open quote, he says, in interviews, photographs, and in person, the group projected a stance of high seriousness combined with a seductive stylishness. Their attitude was a statement of British Afro-diasporic internationalism enacted through a specific sense of generational self-entitlement. 
I come from his family background was Ghanaian and Nigerian. Lawson's was Ghanaian, Togolese, and uh, where am I? Trinidadian. Gopal Johnson and Matheson's was Jamaican, while Oguist and George's was Dominican. This biographical heterogeneity informed the collective's consciousness in complex ways. So in closing then, uh, not for Black Audio Film Collective, the reductive canard of racial essentialism, rather they practiced uh, a relentless quest to harness the African diaspora's kaleidoscopic thought power uh, to combat white supremacy, ultimately, as a historical, economic, and conceptual form of oppression. Thank you. So hopefully that gives a little bit of context for the group's work before we go really in depth with our great panel, who I will introduce uh, right now. Uh, at the far end, uh, Coco Fusco uh, is an interdisciplinary artist and writer. In 1987, she became the first person to write about Black Audio Film Collective outside the UK. In 1988, Fusco organized the first touring exhibition of the work of Black Audio and Sankofa in the US. Uh, the two workshops films were shown at the Collective for Living Cinema, Hall walls and other venues. Uh, next along the line is Kara Keeling, uh, Associate Professor of Cinema and Media Studies at the University of Chicago. Keeling is author of The Witch's Flight, The Cinematic, The Black Femme, and The Image of Common Sense, Duke Uni University Press 2007, and co editor with Josh Kuhn of a selection of writings about sound and American studies entitled Sound Clash, uh, Listening to American Studies, Johns Hopkins University Press 2012 and with Colin McCabe and Cornell West, a selection of writings by the late James A. Snaid entitled European Pedigrees, African Contagions, Racist Traces, and Other Writings, which is Palgrave release in 2003. A second monograph, Queer Times, Black Futures, will be published in the spring of 2019 by New York University Press. Uh, and next to me is Toby Hazlitt, uh, who has written for N Plus One, The New Yorker, Art Forum, and elsewhere. He is currently a doctoral student in English at Yale. So please give our great panel a round of applause. <laughs> and to kick off uh, our prepared remarks for the evening, I'd like to hand over to Coco Fusco. Thank you. Oh, and you turned the slides on. Is that that's what they looked like when we met a law of more than 30 years ago. Okay, so um, one of the few nice things about getting older is being able to witness the long-term benefits of one's efforts, especially those efforts that were met with resistance once upon a time. It gives me great pride to have helped to secure the appreciation and legitimation of the work of Black Audio and Sankofa when the workshops were just getting off the ground. Here's um, some posters and programs from that time. The most significant contribution I can make to this discussion about their legacy is to recall the discursive and social context that gave rise to their work and to our transatlantic alliance. We knew then, as we know now, that we could challenge the resistance to our vision of black culture most effectively by stepping outside our borders, by my bringing black audio and Sankofa to America, and by their taking me to the UK. We joined forces more than 30 years ago, not long after leaving college, at a time when independent film culture was separate from the art world with its own fair um, rules. Um, the, art world, uh, uh, the art world was fairly indifferent to black artists and to racial issues. Um, the investment in post-colonial matters was focused on critiques of MoMA's primitivism in 20th century art show and art forum and lectures by Edward Said and Homi Baba at the Dia Foundation. On the other hand, independent film culture had a more robust discussion going on about the intersection of politics and aesthetics in subverting dominant media culture. Filmmakers we admired understood the strategic benefits of creating discursive and institutional infrastructures, and they made important theoretical interventions. I'm thinking here of Glauber Rocha, Fernando Solanas, and Tomas Gutierrez Alea in Latin America, but also of Peter Wolin, Laura Mulvey, and Colin McCabe in the UK. Mark Nash, who would soon become Isaac Julian's partner, had been the editor of Screen, and he opened doors for us in the film criticism world for us to publish. John Acomfer and I met in 
Havana at the film festival in 1985, and I met the other members of the workshops at various film festivals in 1986. We bonded as the children of black immigrants who had defied our parents' cautious stance by refusing to accept our second class status. The essentialist views of identity espoused by black cultural nationalists irked us. Those nationalists were protectionist about identity, putting black America first while maintaining a romantic attachment to an idea of Mother Africa that had little to do with post-independence realities. They were as unwilling to embrace black cultural production from Europe as they were to accept criticisms from queers and feminists about their monolithic notions of black identity. And here's a picture of my dear friend Marlon Riggs um, in 1991 at the Black Popular Culture Conference, shocking Houston Baker behind him <laughs> with his Unleash the Queen post uh, t-shirt. That was also at that, that event, uh, Houston Baker and uh, Skip Gates were uh, very resistant to uh, looking for Langston at the time because of the outing of Langston Hughes in the film. And there was a big row there between Isaac, Lyle Ashton Harris, and Tom, Thomas Allen Harris on the one hand, and Houston Baker and Skip Gates on the other over the, the, the whether or not to address questions of queer sexuality in black film. Uh, in retrospect, I understand the anxiety about us as economically motivated. They were a generation that had fought for access to public funding for the arts, and they didn't want to lose what they had just attained by means of a separatist argument. Nonetheless, at the time, we saw the battle as an ideological one. We challenged them on all counts in public debates and in film magazines, tussling with the likes of Spike Lee and the Hutland brothers, who were very hostile, and who would soon abandon independent film culture to move to Hollywood. Lucky for us. <laughs> Even Skip Gates, who has since become a major supporter of Isaac Julian's, was not very accepting of looking for Langston's open treatment of the poet's homosexuality back in the day. His resistance came on the heel of Bill Cosby's attempt to prevent Isaac Julian from screening his film at Lincoln Center to prevent Hughes from being outed. That was at the New York Film Festival in 1989. The only counterpoint to this black American default position was the voice of Haile Garima, the Ethiopian filmmaker and professor at Howard University and the mentor to A.J. Fielder, who's now everybody's favorite black film artist, um, who embraced aesthetic experimentation and emphasized his ties to African cinema. While we were seeking to undermine the dominant discourse of cultural nationalism in the black cultural milieu, we were also quite critical of institutional racism in mainstream culture and the prejudices of the white avant-garde that had relegated us to ethnic niches, niches and realist imperatives. I shall never forget being told by white intellectuals at a, for a panel discussion in 1988 that they were astonished by how well-spoken John Acomfra, Reese, and Eddie were, revealing their low expectations of black intellectuals. I also remember Black Audio's shock when they were told by organizers at Third World Newsreel that they needed to serve a lot of fried chicken if they wanted black people to come to their screenings. That was then. Sadly, Salman Rushdie expressed similarly patronizing views by lambasting Black Audio in the British press, calling them unintelligibly and inappropriately avant-garde. Um, his article from 1987, Songs Don't Know the Score, I just pulled uh, a couple of priceless quotes um, from the piece. Uh, but this was very upsetting at the time. This was kind of the major black intellectual in Britain coming out and trashing uh, black audio after they had won the Grierson Award for Handsworth Songs. My essay about black audio and Sankofa, written in 1987, after I spent a summer in London conducting interviews, was a calculated counterattack against all these positions. We were students of post-structuralist theory who wanted to create a post-colonial avant-garde film culture that didn't yet exist. We had to present a rationale to explain why we had to create a different kind of work to change the culture. 
we knew that the debates in European and American film circles about the convergence of political and aesthetic avant-garde lacked adequate engagement with race and colonial histories. We sought to intervene in those discussions of third cinema, which is to say the third world is critique of both Hollywood and European auteurism. So as to link the politics and practices of radical filmmakers in Africa, Asia, and Latin America to our own approaches. And it was black audio, more than anyone else, that insisted on the reframe, reframing the colonial archive as a keystone of their agenda. They dove into the historical record of imperial pomp, plunder, slave, and slavery to tell the long durée version of the story of post-colonial migration to Britain. They did so with an intensity and probity that remains unparalleled in the global art world. It has taken Americans much longer to embrace Black Audio's work than Isaac Julian's. And I was saying that before we started, that for about 15, 20 years, nobody in America wanted to look at Hansworth songs after I did that program. Nobody wanted to show it anywhere. Um, and I think the main reason for that delay has been a conference refusal of a predictable identitarian position and his insistence on an unconventional use of archive. As a film semiotic student in college, I had been the only person of color in my cohort. When I joined a Fanon reading group after leaving grad school and moving to re uh, New York, I was, once again, the only non-white member. Black Audio and Sankofa established families of choice through the workshop structures that were made possible by the Greater London, London Council in the wake of race riots in Brixton. When they adopted me, I gained a sense of belonging to a global black diasporic creative community. Our transatlantic posse included a confra, Lena Gopal, Isaac Julian, Mar Martina Atil, Kojo Eshan, Julian Henriquez, June Giovanni, Karen Alex Alexander, Jelaine Tawadros, Pervez Khan, Anand Patwardhan, Cameron Bailey, and Kabina Mercer. Our protector was Stuart Hall, who joined us for many an event and prodded us with trenchant questions. Paul Gilmore was a more exacting comrade in arms, but an important influence who gave us a language with which to describe how existential questions of belonging were refracted through the paradigms of race and nation. Together we organized festivals on both sides of the Atlantic, edited special issues of film journals, and argued our way onto boards and into archives. As time went on, a younger generation of black artists, filmmakers, and critics from America broke rank with that older, more resistant generation and began to journey to England to meet and eventually collaborate with their counterparts in London, Birmingham, and beyond. Quite frankly, the British scene was more attractive to me than what was going on in America in the 1980s. The conversations were deeper and more intellectually satisfying, and the elasticity of cultural identity was more vigorously explored. It would take at least a decade for that kind of conversation to invade the American Academy in cultural studies much more than in art history. And it would take Oakley and Wezor's shakedown of globalist art curating to create a space for black audio, now smoking dogs, cultural productions in the art world. I will end here by suggesting that in Wezer's focus on archival materials in his short century exhibition about post-independent African art is indebted to a conference seminal appropriation of the colonial archive. I have no doubt that we will continue to feel Black Audio's influence for many years to come. Thank you. Just, just my, yeah, we go. I'd like to hand over to, uh, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. I'll just procrastinate for a second and say, once again, thank you for that insight, Coco. It's, it's really much appreciated. Um, and up next will be Toby Hazlitt, who is almost there. Hi. Uh, thank you to Sarah and everyone at the New Museum for having me. Thank you to my co-panelists. Um, yeah. How do you measure time? 
We live in an age of rupture when the most appalling attitudes about race, labor, and sexual politics are being brandished and reclaimed, bile rising in the throat of history. In the United States, the violence at the border has shockingly intensified, while attacks on civil rights legislation, women's bodily autonomy, and worker power are a vicious rebuke to the very notion of progress. We can't afford to be Whiggish anymore, and frankly, we never could. The past presses against us. History's promises are brutally revoked. At least that's one way of telling the story. We are here to remember the work of Black Audio Film Collective, whose slide tape projections, narrative features, experimental documentaries, and essay films concern the place and purpose of memory itself. Looking back, the work seems like a flashing testament to its historical moment. From Thatcher's neoliberal revolution, to the ironies of multiculturalism, to the centrist slouch of new labor. The group was founded in 1982 in response to riots that shook the UK the previous year and posed the vital question, what does it mean to be black and British? How are lines of class and race drawn and patrolled? For whom and on whose backs was the nation state built? And who in that process is hunted, stifled, exploited, expelled? These questions are irrepressible. They accuse and they recur. But crisis always feels new. It freezes the senses, obstructs the mind, and blots out the past it springs from. Black Audio set itself the task of recovering history's muffled voices and building an art from their shattered language. So their films drink deeply from the colonial archive. Old grainy footage becomes, as John Acomfra has said, a fetish. It glows with mystical power. Kwame Nkrumah saluting his comrades in the newly independent Ghana. Caribbean migrants coming off a ship. Gandhi's body burning on a pyre. These images aren't just striking, but moving. They draw out our desire and remind us that our desire is political, which is a way of saying that the films of Black Audio concern themselves fundamentally with the political will, its failures and its pleasures, its melancholy and its triumph. Gloom is tempting, but what I find nourishing about this work is its refusal to wallow, its insistence on the openness of history. And I see in this tendency, this gallant political patience, the influence of Stuart Hall, the Jamaican cultural theorist and early champion of the group. Hall stands at the junction of two powerful traditions, that of Western Marxism, the New Left, the movement for a democratic anti-imperialist socialism, and of the experience of migration of the black diaspora. If the films of black audio fix their gaze on what is lost, it's because they don't really think it is. The past does not simply lead to, but forces itself upon the present. Struggle is always the struggle for redemption. Hansworth Songs, the collective's first feature-length documentary, is built from jagged fragments of news and archival footage, all pasted together by spoken text, poem, essay, pompous broadcast. The film was a response to the riots. The riots were a response to police abuse. Black audio member Reese Aguist wrote of the film at the time, quote, Hansworth explodes. Sociologists produce exhausted theories. Law and order barons scream for a more demonic regulation of the surplus class. While the theorists theorize, the volcano remains active. Smoke and ashes refuse to disappear. The sulfuric smell defines the mood. The nation is astounded, but Hansworth remains voiceless, strangled into silence by the media barons. Blackness as a category is constructed, at least in part, by the media barons. I'll play the clip. On the 10th of September, 1985, a journalist is pestering a middle-aged black woman on the Lozells Road. He wants her opinion on the disturbances. Did she have a relative involved? Could he talk to one of them? He is writing a story. She looks at the debris and says to him calmly, there are no stories in the riots, only the ghosts of other stories. If you look there, you can see Enoch Powell telling us in 1969 that we don't belong. You can see Malcolm X visiting us in 1965 when the Conservatives said, if you want a nigger for your neighbor, vote Labour. She remembered Malcolm strolling through Smethwick saying, if this is the center of imperialism, then we have a common struggle. For a moment, the voice of Malcolm swooned over the ashes of decline.
A journalist needs a story. The story collapses into an image from the past of Malcolm, the image of a revolutionary possibility seemingly foreclosed. Quote, there are no stories in the riots, only the ghosts of other stories which is to say that there are no final statements, no moments of absolute closure, only the upsurge and scrambling of buried feeling. This is frustrating, and that frustration gives the films of black audio their fragmented form. Writers or researchers feature in so many of these films, the journalists of Hansworth songs, Abena and Testament from 1988, Olivia and Twilight City from 1989. They are our Virgils, guiding us through the inferno of the repressed past. Walter Benjamin dreamed of a past citable in all its moments, of brushing history against the grain, and it's his example which shines through these films. He knew that revolution was not in the name of some future hope, but for the memory of enslaved ancestors, and that memory is a wound, a bomb, a grudge, a burden, an archive, and a political tool. <laughs> In time, we will demand the impossible in order to wrestle from it that which is possible. In time, we will demand that which is right, because what will be just will lie outside present demand. In time, the streets will claim me without apology. In time, I will be right to say there are no stories in the riots, only the ghosts of other stories. touches me about this scene from Hansworth Songs is the boom of the collective voice as it comes streaming in from the past, how it crashes against the image of families and of children. I'll close with a line from Baraka that floated into my head, quote, a political art, let it be tenderness. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Toby. Um, Kara, are you ready to go? I'm ready. Over to Kara Keeling. So hello, and um, also I'll add my thanks to Sarah O'Keefe and um, to Andrea uh, Kaldari, right, for helping to organize this um, event, and also um, Ash for um, facilitating and the rest of the panelists. I'm actually really looking forward to the discussion, so I'll get on with it. If more and better representation were the answer to racist policies and white supremacy, worldviews and, and white supremacist worldviews and practices, black people all over the world would have overcome by now. T today, global media industries serving the United States market thrive on representation, on niche marketing and programming, and on giving everyone who ha can access the internet an opportunity to have their own unique voice be heard. Now, as the presidency of Barack Obama is fading in our memories, it is clear that more and better representations of black people will not shift the balance of power away from white supremacy, as cell phone and other videos of police brutality and mur murder circulate on our private little screens. It is clear that audiovisual evidence that a murder of a black person has been committed is not enough to convince that part of the American citizenry who habitually perceive black existence in public as itself a crime that the killing was wrong. So today, profound challenges are facing those of us who work with, on, and through cinema and media and believe in what we call social and economic justice. So with the urgencies of our moment raising the stakes of what creative intellectuals produce, a retrospective of John Acumpra and of the Black Audio Film Collective's work is an opportunity to consider and, and to reconsider um, the debates we have inherited about race, identity, and representation, and to shift the terms to address our new situation. In Black Independent Filmmaking, a statement by the Black Audio Film Collective, originally published in 1983, John Acomfer writes, quote, the search is not for, authentic for uh, the authentic image but for an understanding of the diverse codes and strategies of representation, end quote. With this as one of their goals, the Black Audio Film Collective experimented with film form in ways that underscored the close connections between form and content. <coughs> if the existing codes and strategies of representa representation held in place 
what a compra called in the same statement common sense assumptions, then it follows that experimenting with the logics and presumed coherence of those codes and strategies might challenge the common sense through which racist practices are authorized and justified. The Black Audio Film Collective approached film and video making less as a quest for representation and more as a practice of creating new forms through which new, more just relations of power might be expressed. So while they frame their statements in terms of representation and identity, I've turned to their work in retrospect and admittedly pilfering their praxis to address present problems because I think it offers a way to conceptualize filmmaking as less about representation and identity and more about the related and I would argue more fundamental questions of what registers as valuable, as coherent and significant and what remains in need of repair. And I think we heard some of this um, already as, as Coco was uh, talking about the sort of way that the Black Audio Film Collective was already thinking about these things, right? So the Black Audio Film Collective offers us ways to think about the role audiovisual images play in upholding racism and colonial relations over time and to conceptualize a film practice and a deployment of sound and image more broadly that offers another or other logics of relation. So I've been thinking about the films of the Black Audio Film Collective, therefore, as experiments in cinematic reparation, reparations that center film form as a fundamental system through which we collectively <coughs> decipher who and what matters and how. Though there are several films that I could um, discuss to make this case, including, of course, Hanworth songs, but also seven songs for Malcolm X. I think it's important to remember that um, in response to the Salman Rushdie piece that Stuart Hall um, responded by saying, okay, you're misunderstanding what they're doing. They're actually trying to um, d develop a new language, right? This is about a kind of search for a new language. So I think there are several of their films I could turn to, but because I've been interested in, in writing about Afrofuturism for the past several years, um, I've worked more closely with The Last Angel of History from 1996. And so I'll show you, because um, I've been thinking quite a bit and talking about this film, just the very beginning sequence of this film. We came across the story of a blues man from the 1930s, a guy called Robert Johnson. Now, the story goes that Robert Johnson sold his soul to the devil at the crossroads in the Deep South. He sold his soul, and in return, he was given the secret of a black technology, a black secret technology that we know to be now as the blues. The blues begat jazz, the blues begat soul, the blues begat hip hop, the blues begat R&B. Now, flash forward 200 years into the future. Next figure, another hoodlum, another bad boy, scavenger, poet figure. He's called a data thief. 200 years into the future, the data thief is told a story. If you can find the crossroads, a crossroads, this crossroads, if you can make an archaeological dig into this crossroads, you'll find fragments, techno fossils. And if you can put those elements, those fragments together, you'll find the code. Crack that code and you'll have the keys to your future. You've got one clue, and it's a phrase, mothership connection. Okay, so I think one thing that I'd put on the table for, for further discussion that just kind of came to me is that I think this film really also underscores the significance and importance of music and sound to their practice as well. But The Last Angel of History was one of many films that Acompra shot on digibeta, digibeta tape in the 1990s. The film focuses on the sonic aspects of Afrofuturism, especially music, and the geographical, industrial, political, and philosophical logics that have informed their production. What is most interesting to me, and the reason I chose this clip as part of my introductory remarks today, is the way the film, as part of the th its thematic um, engagement with technology, is itself an enactment 
of Afrofuturism insofar as it relates black existence to technology through cinema. So while The Last Angel of History centers issues of black existence, black culture, and science and technology, the film's formal characteristics, as well as the specific contexts of its production and circulation, tap into the aesthetics and logics of computational, database-driven media. For example, the sequence from the beginning of the film experiments with what we might call an algorithmic editing style, right, with algorithmic editing styles through which any image can be inserted into or combined with another. So a character from the film, the data thief, animates the processes through which the images from the database of human history can be cut, selected, and framed according to an algorithm that celebrates the intersection of black history and techne. We can see the computation and database logics in the data thief's access to the range of images, histories, and narratives about the past. And this is part of the broader sort of archival project that has been spoken about. So in this regard, the data thief is a character through which the last angel of history layers associations between audiovisual images from disparate times and geographical locations to reveal a commonality between filmmaking and computation. So this comparison between filmmaking and computation is important because while it's easy to see how computation relies upon calculations, algorithms, measurements, and equivalences, it is harder to grasp how film and video making rely on these things as well. Yet aesthetically, films and videos often do rely on formula, formulas of this kind in order to render something significant or not, in order to register it as something that matters or not. So I see John Acomfra and the Black Audio Film Collective's cinematic practice in this vein as, as, as aesthetic experiments designed to discover in the database of human history the combinations of audiovisual images that can crack the code and assemble the common senses that will underwrite black liberation. They help us to understand that challenging present relations of power calls for informed yet improvisational experiments with the formal logics of film and media. It calls for changing the algorithms through which film and media conventionally work, rather than simply insisting on adding new inputs into a machine already calibrated to effectively reproduce existing relations. So I'll leave it there. Let's start. So we're, we're very keen to get uh, you guys, the audience, involved soon, but I think we're going to um, open up just uh, with the panel with a few questions first. And I think one thing, actually, I'll come to you, Kara, if you don't mind straight away. Um, something that really always strikes me about Black Audio Film Collective is that the audio comes first mm -hmm. in the name. They're, they're kind of equal billing in a way. The work of Trevor Matheson, who's the group's longtime sound designer, and still works on all of Smoking Dogs, um, the, the cu current production company, which is Trevor, uh, John, Lena, David. Um, so I'm just interested, maybe, Cara, to begin with, and then you guys feel free to chip in, about the use of sound and the profundity um, that, that the layering of, of sound archive brings to the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I mean, I think th the sound, and, and if you haven't gone upstairs to, to sort of experience the um, the uh, exhibit, it's, it, it really is exciting to hear it in that space because the sound is such an important aspect of what they're doing aesthetically. And I think part of what's interesting is, is that there's not a sort of like one-to-one -one correspondence between what you're seeing and what you're hearing, but there's more of a kind of like dialogue, I think, happening where you could almost see, and I think actually um, someone, someone I read, I can't quite properly attribute this, but I did read someone who said um, that you know if you took the um, images you know off of Hansworth Tale and just had the soundtrack, you'd have a really profound sort of like audio essay. So there's there's a really you know I think very important investment in the work that sound does in cinema that doesn't just tie it to images but acknowledges that film itself is an audiovisual medium and that those two things actually can work in relationship with each other or even in, in really different ways. And I think you get that just from listening to the, the, the kind of um, you know, textures of the film's soundtrack. 
what I would add to that in a kind of you know biographical way is that uh, the conversations that we would have back in the day went, were mostly about music. Mm -hmm. um, John is a has a huge music library. They're incredible connoisseurs, and also Kojo's first book, More Brilliant Than the Sun, was a really mostly about music. Right. And so the conversation, you know, the film, yeah, we talk about films we like, but we would sit around listening to music hours and hours, day after day, trying to find tracks, right? Oh, did you hear about this? You know, and, they, and, and their interest in music was, had, they were very much against this notion that true black music is either, you know, is tribal or um, live. They were very, very, always very interested in this notion of what you do in a studio, how you blend and um, collage sound. And so, hence the interest in Lee Scratch Perry um, and going back to Studio One and listening and figuring out and unpacking the way that recording transformed black sound, right? And, uh, and the other thing they were really interested in was uh, Detroit techno. And so a lot of the soundscapes that Trevor made, in, you know, like for Hansworth songs, for any urban piece, had a lot of industrial sound in it, right? To mix with the sounds of music and then distorted sounds from other films. I mean, they, they have, the archival research project wasn't just a visual one, it was also an aural one, mm -hmm. you know? And I, I don't think that that's ever changed mm -hmm. in the work, I think that since They've started to produce more uh, work for museums. It, you can't have dialogue. Nobody wants to have dialogue in a museum <laughs> video. That's been my big problem with my own work. Um, <laughs> I, that I can't stop talking, and so. They, but you know, you want to you want to really hit the big biennials. You have to stop talking, and so they just <laughs> they just uh, you know. So so Trevor just went to has just gone to town, mm -hmm. right? And John just lets him make more and more sound and doesn't put any talking in anymore. <laughs> I guess I also think that the sound affects what the image means if indeed the image has a stable or realizable meaning. I mean, maybe this is very obvious, but in the clip that I showed where Malcolm X is walking down the street in Birmingham, obviously that's a memory. Um, the image itself is archival. It has a kind of indexical value. Malcolm X is the consummate black patriarch who we're supposed to be able to seize upon in a moment of crisis, whose image remains something that inspires people, but more importantly, inspires them in a rather direct and unchanging way, supposedly. Mm -hmm. And then you have something like musique concrète or a kind of more technologically influenced, openly synthetic composition it distorts your relationship to the archival material. You still feel the attachment, but the attachment is now at an angle, or it has to bypass some other, again, admittedly manufactured feeling, and you because start the to- Because they're recognizing that the archive is also, in a sense, manufactured. Completely, right? that yeah. The whole, that the history of what you know is, uh, is basically what you can see, and what mm -hmm. you can understand about what you can see. Yeah. And particularly for our generation and younger, and you know, nowadays, like, nobody has a relationship to reading anything other than Twitter. Uh, so, you know, it is, oh, totally, history mm -hmm. is all about visuals. And it's mostly communicated through music videos to young people. Yeah. Right. And that was something interesting about Channel 4 and how radical Channel 4 was because a lot of the, the archival stuff that Black Audio Film Collective were drawing from, as well as the colonial film archives, was the BBC, yeah. which has this incredibly powerful voice as an officially state-sanctioned um, voice of truth and voice of authority. So those juxtapositions are extremely powerful coming through on Channel 4, um, which is a new option. Um, I'd like to kind of go back to the, the Salman Rushdie, Stuart Hall conflagration moment and link it to a sense of discussing challenging and profound progressive art in a climate of anti-intellectualism, which we're currently in right now. And perhaps, Coco, speak to your experiences of actually trying to get people to pay attention to that work um, and seeing people like Darkus Howe, a very you know well-regarded activist, uh, responding to Stuart Hall, who'd responded to Salman Rushdie, defending Rushdie in the first place. Yeah, you know, uh, I mean, and, and I could, 
uh, trot out names to give you the parallel arguments in the United States, but the, the, in the United States it was a lot easier to simply be chauvinistic about it and say, well, you know, these are black people with funny accents and they're talking about something that doesn't have, have to do with us and we have to be worried about our community and, uh, and uplifting our group over here and not about these wackos over there. So it didn't really get much deeper than that, even though, you know, Bill Greaves was out there making symbiopsycho taxiplasm or whatever it's called. And, <laughs> you know, there were a few, like, uh, I counter examples to this, but they didn't get a lot of traction in the milieus that were uh, promoting themselves as representative of blackness for the culture, whether it be documentarians who were producing things for public television mostly, or um, you know the, uh, the independents with an uh, aspiring to go to Hollywood, like um, the Hudlin brothers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the thing is, is that there wasn't, the art world wasn't interested in this stuff either. <laughs> so, you know, it was hard to kind of, I mean, I came out of film studies. We, we read framework and screen and, you know, we read the journals of the time. We followed the model of kind of avant-garde uh, and politically engaged avant-garde filmmakers in the third world. That was our model. It was like, okay, so nobody wants to know from us. Well, we're just going to get out there and we're going to have our manifestos and we're going to have our essays that explain our practice and that kind of system present a systematic argument for what we want to overthrow. And, um, and let's see who listens, right? <laughs> um, and you know, fortunately, there was a, a, a small network in the UK of black people who were involved in film programming and festivals in Birmingham and Manchester and in Glasgow. And you know, and off we, you know, I would like fly in on a Friday and Saturday morning, we'd all get up and take the train and off we go, you know, to these spots to have our conversations. And Stuart would very often show up to support. I mean, he was amazing. We, you know, why did, why did he care about a bunch of kids? We weren't the New Left Review. We weren't <laughs> famous, right? But he came and he taught and he was kind and he was supportive and he asked us really important, you know, I remember one time I just kind of, oh, the commodification of identity. And he's just like, stop, Coco, tell me what you think about that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, like that was how, that's, that's how we started. And we, uh, Isaac did a special issue on race for screen. Um, else, I think John and maybe some two other people did a framework issue. You know, we just would like try to take over, okay, let's take over this journal and do this, let's do, and that was, but we stayed within a very um, discreetly film milieu, mm -hmm. right? And you know, uh, the other thing is, I mean, I was saying the black audio, nobody was interested in black audio, but black audio wasn't so interested in the art world either. I mean, part of the reason that tr uh, Isaac's transition was easier was because he kind of, jumped ship with film culture after Young Sold Rebels and went to the art world and found much more acceptance and also was more embraced by uh, queer culture here. And so that made it easier for him to continue. But, uh, you know, uh, Smoking Dogs kept knocking on the door at the BBC, um, even as Channel 4 got more mm -hmm. uh, conservative. Um, but in England, in Europe, the advantage that Black Audio and then Smoking Dogs had was that they could sell to TV. They would get, they had agents um, in Europe who would sell to Arte and to uh, what is it ZDF? I think it was it was the German one. That that there was a period in the 80s and 90s when there were kind of equivalents of Channel Four all over Europe. Mm -hmm. There w it wasn't all consolidated yet, and you could sell. And so that was the money that they could use to then go back to work, right? And if they could get a commission to make something from Channel 4 after the workshop structure fell apart, then that would uh, propel them forward. And so there was, that, there was that kind of niche for them. That didn't exist here. They couldn't sell to PBS. Nobody at PBS was going to buy their work um, and show their documentaries or, or their feature films. And so those were lean years in mm -hmm. terms of presentation in the United States. There was a small, you know, there were some people who knew about them right? But it really wasn't, there wasn't a big following or a demand for black work from Europe. Um, and it really wasn't until Oakley put them in Documenta. And, you know, but prior to that, there were several years when friends were telling them, you know, you really got to 
move into the art world. We'll get, you know, things have gotten a little better over there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, they, they kind of slowly picked up on that. That then the critical mass followed the, the acceptance at that high level. It was, well, they were in Documenta. Okay, and now Kojo and Angeli are gonna do a big show about them. Oh, I can't remember where they did, was it Whitechapel or the Barbican or something? They did a big uh, uh, retrospective and did a book about them. And then suddenly, it was like okay, now you know. And the work started to, to come back into the, the, the well, mainstream. Well, but then they came. Then more. they were. Then they became artists, mm -hmm. right? Um, that who who could be uh, um, embraced as artists, and from that level of acceptance, and you know, you, you get in Documenta Venice Biennale, some American curator is going to call you. Um, pretty fast, and so, and so, it, <laughs> and so yeah. it did, and so they did. Um, I wanted right. to pick up briefly on, and you mentioned Stuart Hall, who's obviously yeah. a crucial figure in this. And for anyone in the audience who's not aware, um, John and Smoking Dogs made a wonderful film called The Stuart Hall Project, and which originated as a three-screen installation called the The Unfinished Conversation, I believe, um, and that is one of the the most beautiful, powerful, and purest. Um, examples of the, the work that the, the group does with music, the way that Miles Davis's work is used in that film, so I really recommend that. Um, Toby, I'll come to you perhaps to talk about the, the alarming prescience uh, of, of the work and looking at something like um, the riots or uprisings that happened in Tottenham in the UK in, in 2011 in response to the, the police murder of a, of a young black man. Um, almost note for note, the Conservative Party response was the same as what we see in Hands With Songs. So it's a broad question, but perhaps speak to the, the enduring qualities of the group's work. I read a book recently about riots, um, as opposed to strikes. It's called Riot, Strike, Riot. And actually, it relates rather directly to the intellectual lineage of Black Audio Film Collective. Um, because this person, Joshua Clover, was trying to answer the question, why do we live in an age that is defined not by strikes, but by riots? Why is the default moral panic about these urban, often racially specific insurrections, as opposed to the threat of strikes? And the short answer to that is the failure of labor, which, not I want to say the failure, but the at least temporary defeat of the labor movement on both sides of the Atlantic. And that is the result of and has had profound world altering political consequences. And that was happening basically at around the time Black Audio was starting to make work. The defeat of the miners, the Thatcherite assault against organized labor with the emerging generation of people who were born from black immigrants like many of the members of Black Audio Film Collective were, created an environment in which who counted as the proper left was shifting in ways that were profoundly painful to a lot of people who still remember the new left, um, who were in solidarity with Indochina or Vietnam, um, who still retained the Marxist dream. And then there was the move into the so-called new social movements in which actually maybe the labor metaphysic wasn't what was important. Maybe new theories of sexual difference, of racial construction, of queerness and of blurred national boundaries might actually hold the answers to, I mean, to put it plainly, liberation. The idea that whatever comes next after this current arrangement has to emerge from a category that isn't, to use the cliched phrase, the white working class. These conversations reached, a, I think, an apex in the 1980s because it was precisely the failure of a previous left and the emergence of these new constituencies that created the conditions for something like the riots in Brixton or the riots in Handsworth. And I think that right now we are living in, hopefully, the final throes of the neoliberal regime. This is something that was invented, an ideology that was imposed at around the time when this work was being made. And so if there are historical resonances, I mean, we can look to, I mean, the material history um, the scant protections for workers, the fact that many people, many of them black, are denied the wage. That's the real difference, according to this new work of scholarship, between a riot and a strike. E.P. Thompson in The Making of the English Working Class draws a distinction between a riot and a strike, not being one of violence. There are many strikes that were very, very violent, and there are many riots that actually aren't that violent, but as a difference between production struggles and circulation struggles that uh, they're both price setting gestures. A strike is setting the price of labor 
a riot is when your only contact with the economic is through production. The circulation of, uh, uh, is through circulation or consumption. So riots are supposed to be things that liberate goods and if they're not actually about looting, it's still for people who are largely jobless. And it's a very long answer to your question, but it is true that the socio-political machinery was set up at precisely the time that this work was being made and if we notice echoes or traces of the same political problems, I think that it's useful to look back at this work and see how difficult it was to represent um, that part of the form that Black Audio was trying to capture was a representation of what seemed like a truly new and incomprehensible political environment. Well, I would just add to that that our parents were the black working class, <laughs> um, but our generation didn't have jobs, and people just a bit older than us didn't have jobs in Britain, and that's why they were there was no labor movement for mm -hmm. from a, a protest against Thatcher. It was the black unemployed mm -hmm. who were rioting, right? And it was mostly young men. And that the, the thing is that that rioting was immediately uh, taken up as a reason for why blacks shouldn't be there at all, right? And, that, uh, and also a way to kind of criminalize en masse the entire population because one group of people were rioting, hence, the need to have the conversation about how riots are represented and what they're representative of. And it's worth making the point as well, I don't know how familiar people are with the rec recent Windrush scandal uh, in the UK where uh, people of my, my grandparents' generation who came uh, to the UK from Jamaica uh, in the late 40s and 50s and were given, were afforded citizenship essentially, have recently had that citizenship in some cases taken away and been told they need, they need to leave. Um, they've been refused medical care. So it's particularly poignant to watch films like Twilight City, which is extraordinarily prescient on the issue of gentrification. Um, it's, it's a sc scary film to watch in many ways. But to watch these films initially from a prism of understanding or belief that you, you know, your, your relatives, your ancestors come from a place of belonging, but only to months later see that, that certainty stripped away. Um, and that really comes through in the films, uh, through their lack of didacticism. I think there's, there's a hesitancy in all of the films, not to say that they, they pull punches or that they're tentative, but they allow for multiple readings and understandings. Um, and Cara, to Cara, excuse me, to speak more to prescience, let's talk about The Last Angel of History, which I believe is the first recorded or filmed um, use of the word Afrofuturism. You know, which is now everywhere, from Janelle Monet to Black Panther. You know, it's it's yeah. it's worked its way into the fabric of culture, how we discuss it, to Coco's favorite Twitter. <laughs> uh, it's <laughs> it's it's everywhere. So let's talk about how how anticipatory Black Audio were in 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 that uh, approach. Yeah, and I would. I mean, I would. I think this is directly connected to what we were just talking about because there's also a way in which in the midst of what they were experiencing as, as sort of transformations in um, uh, the logics th through which people could be organized, right? They, part of the, what I think makes them so pressing is where they went to talk about that. And I think, um, you know, turning to something like Afrofuturism in that moment is part of a, a way of thinking about, and for them it was a way of, um, thinking about sort of the significance of um, technology and uh, the imagination in um, sort of addressing, <laughs> right, uh, what seemed to be a kind of foreclosure of black futurity. So I think um, it was important in that moment in a way that in that now it's it's a little bit um, as you said, it's sort of seeped into the culture in, I think, a, a different way. But I feel like part of what made it interesting as it was becoming interesting to them through the late 80s and then in the 90s um, was this sense that something like the imagination, right? Something like a kind of imaginative relationship to technology of which film is one, right? <laughs> um, that that uh, an imaginative relationship to sort of like audiovisual um, uh, practice that, that that could actually 
be somewhere to go to, to, to as a kind of cultural practice that has a political, uh, the possibility of a political force, right? So I think, um, you know, that one of the things that makes them so prescient is also sort of what they were, what they were looking at in addition to how they were looking at it, but where they went to sort of begin to anchor a kind of response to the, the types of pressures that they were noticing, which were not only these broader sort of um, world historical transformations, right, like neoliberalism, but also um, the kinds of cultural pressures around the ideas that people have about what blackness is, what counts as, you know, a black person um, in the U.S. or in the U.K. or diasporically, you know, those types of things. I think um, were the 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 questions that they were that they were wrestling with, and in wrestling with those kinds of things, where they went to kind of wrestle with them, I think um, helped them to have a kind of longevity that we're feeling now. Thank you very much. Well, you know, there's only there was only one way to think about Africa then, was mm -hmm. to think about it as a root, as something that you left behind, right? There was no way to think about the future the future of Africa mm -hmm. or the future of Africanness. That was just simply not part of the conversation because the kind of uh, romanticized version of you know the 1970s dashiki Afro version of going, it was back to Africa, mm -hmm. right? Back in time, back to the root. So they were re reacting against that backward-looking model of Africa and to try to come up with, a, with one that actually could negotiate with post-independent realities, but also that, could have, that Africa could be a futurity, mm -hmm. could be a way of thinking about another time that hasn't yet come, right? And I do think the music took them there um, because it was because th there was also, you know, that looking at the, the record covers and that mothership um, was, you know, we, there were, we had a lot of conversations about <laughs> the record covers. We had a lot of conversations about what it meant for um, the sound of blackness to be purely technological, to have no, nothing live in it, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, you know, who was talking about that kind of, um, you know, mediatic existence was sci-fi. Right. And it I was think that's Delaney. an important Correct. component too that makes it, so important for our moment when we can now see and feel <laughs> that like this sort of technology is part of how we and, and Samuel are Delaney features in the in the film and he, he's wonderful. Um, thank you guys. At that point, I'd really like to open it up uh, to the audience for questions and comments for our panel. Please don't be shy, otherwise it will be me going on all night. We don't want that. <laughs> Who's going to go first? Thank you. Testament, maybe? Yeah. yeah. So maybe, to Toby, we can turn to you to talk briefly about the film Testament. Um, from 1988, um, directed by John Acumfer, which you mentioned earlier. So to just maybe give a flavor of what the film's about and why it's so profound. Yeah, uh, it's a narrative feature, which is not exactly typical for black audio. Um, and the story is basically about this person named Abena, who's a television broadcaster who works for British documentaries. She is Ghanaian <coughs> and she had stayed in Ghana after Kwame Nkrumah won independence from the British and set up what he thought was going to be the first of many nations devoted to African socialism. And so she was a member of the Convention People's Party. And then in 1966, there's a coup and she's forced to leave. And so the film, it tr tracks her return to Ghana, her reckoning with her own political and personal past, and she comes across these characters that she knew from her former life who have all at this point survived waves and waves and waves of political turmoil, um, and the Ghana that she still holds on to is the brief flare of 
Marxist possibility, which has now been stifled. I mean, the question of state-imposed ideology and what socialist hope there is or was for Africa, I think, is pretty central to the film. Um, there are shots of the Nkrumah Ideological Institute where people are supposedly like reading Mao, and then you see, in more or less the next scene, people throwing books by Lenin and Trotsky onto a burning pile. <laughs> um, but the film actually ends up taking a kind of metacinematic direction because it turns out that something that she's trying to do for the documentary that she is there to make is to make contact with Werner Herzog's film crew, which is also filming in Ghana. They're filming Cobra Verde, and of course the contact is broken. They don't get access to Werner Herzog's uh, film set, and so on the one hand, it's a film within a film because it's about the making of a documentary, but on the other and hand, there's also- plays the director of the fictional <laughs> film within, yeah. Um, but they never make contact with the white fiction of Africa, which actually is very well funded and is not being made for public television and actually isn't really that formally inventive. In fact, it's actually just straightforwardly thrilling. So there is always the possibility that there is a well-funded white fantasy gleaming somewhere off screen. And what you actually have is the melancholy of African post-independence. So. And which, which is a sh shadows John's life. Right? Yeah, because entirely. Because his father worked for Nkrumah, was killed by the CIA. He and his wife were com communists. The family fled. John left with his brothers and his mother when he was six years old. Um, and they, it's a good thing they didn't end up in the Soviet Union because that was mom's first choice. Mm -hmm. But they were, they went to the UK and were not able to go back to Ghana for a very, very long time. So it's all, you know, it's a bit, he's a bit of the, John is a bit of the, the woman. And, you know, the whole story in mm -hmm. a way is a kind of reliving of, of his own situation. It's mm -hmm. an incredible sister film to, te uh, to Twilight City. Yeah. They both followed similar forms. Uh, yeah, in the front. So for anyone at the back who didn't hear, the question is about the legacy of Black Audio Film Collective, both uh, in the UK and internationally. Well, we're, we're in the cradle of <laughs> one incredible you know, resurgence of John and the, the collective's work right here. Um, this is a huge exhibition and a huge moment for, for the collective and a, I think a clear sign that the work is being treated very seriously with the respect and, and the insight in terms of some of the writing about it. Um, that it really deserves. I mean, do you guys want to talk to the, I, I can come to the British thing in a bit, or we can talk about it afterwards. Well, let's make use of the panel. Let's talk, <laughs> uh, let's talk to you guys about the, the legacy of the work and as it pertains to you guys, you guys teaching it um, and how you, how you feel that the, the sustainability of the work um, has, has shaken down. Yeah, well, I'd add um, briefly two things. One is that I think it's important to also remember that they did workshops and they were interested themselves in kind of like education. Um, so in that regard, I would think, and you, could, you all could speak to this better in, in terms of if you could actually track that, but I would think that the legacy is there through a kind of pedagogy that was part of their practice. Um, and the other thing I would say is that in addition to the art world, um, their work actually was part of the important texts that someone like Stuart Hall, but also Kabina Mercer, um, and other people who were writing about sort of like black film, black culture, black identity from a black British perspective um, were looking at when they were writing. And those became sort of like the most, arguably, <laughs> the most influential texts for those of us who are studying in the US um, in the sort of mid to late 1990s or probably earlier than that, like through the 80s, uh, from the mid 80s through to the end of the 90s. So those were the things that people were thinking about and reading and, and um, trying to wrestle with as we were thinking about other things as well. So I think that that's another sort of like way that I would trace the influence is to say that the scholarship that was produced through an engagement with their work actually influenced, I would say, you know, most of what we think about um, when we 
from an academic perspective anyway, sort of think about um, cinema identity um, blackness representation colonialism. So I think that, that that is a pretty profound influence. Yeah. I think uh, black audio in particular, they, they went, it was a struggle after the workshops ended for a while because they had to come up with another viable economic model um, to produce. And uh, they didn't have an automatic entry to Channel 4 the way they had when they were a workshop that part of the deal was that your work would be shown on Channel 4. Channel 4 changed a lot in the 90s and became much more commercially. It became a lot more BBC-like. Yeah. And so they lost that kind of autumn. And then they had to struggle and fight for it and bid on projects, right? And there are you know, proposals that they had that have been sitting there for years and then somebody else more famous comes with the you know, similar subject matter and gets the project. So the 90s were difficult. They kept on working for television, but it wasn't like they were being championed by anybody anywhere. It really, the, the shift comes as they move into the art world and we all get a bit older and then John becomes, you know, Order of the British Empire and starts getting these awards and, and also becomes John Acomfra. Right, because it was Black Audio Film Collective and you weren't allowed to name anybody's name for a long time. So the art world made Smoking Dogs into John Acomfra, which I have a little bit of, you know, some trepidation about uh, uh, supporting that, but nonetheless, that's what it is. But in doing that, it has actually um, enabled the group to work at a much uh, more, a much faster pace. And, uh, and to uh, be absorbed now by a very young generation of uh, people from art history and cultural studies who are doing a lot to kind of institutionalize the work. There, isn't, there wasn't a very large body of literature about the films after the first explosion in the 80s until Smoking Dogs becomes John Acomfra and becomes artwork absorbed by museums. Which in a way speaks to the, the irresistible allure of authorship, um, cross arts. I suppose that happened with Sankofa, which began as Sankofa Film and Video, and then it became Isaac Julian. Yeah. The third prominent black workshop of the era was Chedo, which ultimately became Menelik Shabazz yeah. as well. So that happens across all three. Something that else is really interesting to me is there's something really uh, deeply anomalous about black audio mm -hmm. in that they work together as a collective for 16 years. You know, that's a long time to work with the same group of people. Um, and it's not a surprise that the other groups didn't last that long. So yes. that, that as a legacy, they're not really like anybody else, um, it, you know, in terms of the work they produced, but also the simple fact that they existed and those conditions flourished for them. As Coco says, the, the opportunities for funding, the, the commissioning at Channel 4 became a lot less progressive. So they do sent this kind of remarkable one-off in a way. I don't know if, Toby, you want to speak to this at all. Well, I just think it's interesting and, and completely appropriate that when we talk about the legacy of the collective that we actually end up talking about uh, very real and influential institutions that because it comes out of a British context and a British funding structure, actually whatever other difficulties the collective faced, ultimately they were hooked into the distribution of public television. And I think it's also notable that a lot of how their work is exhibited is actually forthrightly pedagogical. I think that the fact that they were keeping up with the theoretical and academic currents of the day, first of all, it doesn't really seem like anybody in film is quite doing that now. Um, and also, they happen to live through a time of incredible intellectual and openly academic ferment. And so it's interesting to me that they're still being adopted in courses, and I find that a lot of the distribution of their work has to do with teaching people about diaspora. I mean, Twilight City, which I didn't show a clip of, is actually my personal favorite. The people in the movie are um, Paul Gilroy, Homi Baba, Femi Otitoju. I mean, these are people with tenure, basically. Um, and, and that's not irrelevant to the constitution of an intellectual community. I would also but say... Th these are the pe these were our peers. Exactly. Yeah, but, and but <laughs> why wouldn't they be there? They, they were our peers at the time. They were the champions of the work. They were the discourse. They were mm -hmm. as interested in the discourses that John and Lena and others were working with as as the filmmakers were. So it, was a, it wasn't a kind of, I don't think it was so odd. 
No, it wasn't odd, but it's true that I can't think of a single American film collective that had a similar trajectory. I just think it's unique. Um, and that also contributes to part of the way that the work has survived, which is largely within the academic circles that the filmmakers themselves ran in. Well, um, but I, I, I don't think that that's what has sustained them. If that was the case, they would be much more, they would have been coming to the United States much more often to, to speak at universities. What really sustained them financially was television in Europe. Nobody cut a check for them in this country anywhere near what a German television station or a Channel 4 would, and their productions, even though they're not, most of them are not feature productions, are very expensive because of the archive. So they relied on getting huge sums of money from television stations in Europe to pay for the, that archive, and the way that people were exposed to them was broadcast. Because the deal is, you, you know, we give you $100,000 and you give us material for TV, right? I mean, yeah, there's a handful of professors in the United States who show their work, but believe me, they show a lot more of Spike Lee and Julie Dash than they'll ever show of black audio. Um, and there's a lot more film scholarship on African American production than there is of black audio, but there are a lot of intellectual filmmakers of color outside the United States who also make films with other intellectuals um, and, uh, in, and interview other intellectuals, and it's the norm. The, we are the oddity, okay? The, the, the rest of the world has a lot of intellectuals who make films, whether it's Ghadar or Usman Zemben or any, it's the, the difference is here, but there are, the ex there are some exceptions here in the independent film se sector or somebody like Todd Haynes who was my classmate, who still will talk about Freud and Lacan and go to Cannes Film Festival and talk. It's funny that you say that because when I was reading your work, I always thought you were British. <laughs> I was just like, yeah, well, because yeah. I just put you in the same we'll, 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 we'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> um, at, at this point, anybody else? Uh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Could you just wait for the mic, yeah. please? Thanks. In English is broken here, your essay on the Black Audio Film Collective, you don't name any of the names, or at least the conference name is not there. And I remember reading that and wondering why I didn't know this. Um, you alluded to you couldn't name them, and I'm well, just you curious but, you about know, the, that. The, the politics of the group was that they were a collective, and that in the same way that group material was a collective, or Grand Fury was a collective. Um, you know, or the, 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 this was the 80s was a time of collectives, right? And uh, you know, you don't name who the Gorilla Girls are, right? They are the Gorilla Girls. Well, Black Audio was Black Audio and Sankofa was Sankofa. And if, and when people started to separate them out, it was the source, it produced a lot of tension in the group. I mean, you know, Sankofa basically broke up because Isaac Julian became Isaac Julian, right? And that was just not, you know, the, the women in the group were just like, okay, well, bye, you know? <laughs> if that's the way it was going to be. Right, uh, well, because of the, the politics of the time, was it just a different kind of politics? Oh, uh, at the back, and then we'll come to you. I was, I was, I was wondering, like, what you, what, like, what all of you guys thought about, like, the, I guess, wh like, what's at stake in terms of, for, like, black cinema? Because if you think about, or I'm, I'm thinking about, like, Arthur Jaffa, um, and the type of, like, work that he's making and how it's directly related to, like, the black, Cinema, the the Black Audio Collective, like what like what is that at stake? Like how do we like reckon with this idea of like blackness and like black people and just like the preservation of this material? That's a big question and a good question. Yeah. Um, would anybody on the panel like to field it first? So are are you? Uh, uh, maybe I need a little bit of clarification. So <laughs> are you asking um, w what we think about Arthur J. Farr, what we think about sort of black well film in the <laughs> U.S.? Er, yeah. All of the above. Uh -huh. it, I guess <laughs> more so. Kind of what's at stake? Yeah, like what's at stake? Like really, really like what's at, at, at stake? Because all of, of you come from these, like di like wear these different hats within like, like these like overlapping communities of like, act, like, uh, the, like the academy mm -hmm. and art. And like, what's at stake? Like, we have we have like like I think in terms of the amnesia and like the legacy of the Black Audio Film Collective, like we have now we have we now have Arthur Jaffa, who's very 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 mainstream and is doing and who shot uh, seven songs from Malcolm X <laughs> yeah. for Black Audio. Yeah, and and but but 
like what like what is at stake in terms of this legacy and like reckoning in in, in re reckoning with like these like histories presently? Well, I mean, AJ's been around for. We don't now have AJ. We've always had AJ. Uh, you know, he he's been around forever. He shot Daughters of the Dust. You know, he's shot like half the music videos that black performers are in in this country. He's just recently decided to um, turn some of the material that he's been making on his own into artworks that can be sold by Gavin Brown. Yeah, I mean, I, that's what's happened. But I think this right? is actually, for me, a really important point, is the fact that someone like AJ, if we just take him as our example, but I think there are other people, right? Um, one of the things that happen with people who are serious filmmakers, um, like the Black Audio Film Collective in, in, um, in the UK, but also in the US, is that they were not really able to make films. So even if you take like people from the LA Rebellion, which we could kind of associate AJ with also through working with Julie Dash and others, they, they weren't really able to make films after leaving film school. So to me, there's a way that like, part of what is at stake is a kind of deep um, knowledge of the, what it means, <laughs> right? It means to, you know, a d kind of deep knowledge and a way of thinking about the significance of black film and black filmmaking over time as part of a kind of thing that people have been working with and whether you want to call it like the creation of a film language, which mm. I, I personally would not, but that's the easiest way to put it, right? Like whether it's something like that, the people that we're talking about in Black Audio Film Collective, as, as Coco was saying, spent a lot of time thinking about what that meant and thinking about what was at stake and thinking about aesthetics and it, their relationship to politics, right? And I think part of what happens when it becomes a commercial enterprise is that that kind of like depth of investment in an ongoing project around film um, is 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 not there in the same way, right? I, um, just, I was just going to, sorry to jump in, but just to talk mm -hmm. about, you, Coco, you mentioned Haile Garima earlier, mm -hmm. and perhaps framing this in terms of, of capital and being able to, you know, Donna, you're not too, fan of the, too much of a fan of the term, but to create new languages. Haile spoke of film itself being an imperial medium, um, and I suppose it's the way that filmmakers, black filmmakers, are able to reinscribe, reinterpret that language, create new forms of delivery, and still exist within capital frameworks that make the, the process of making art sustainable and or profitable? I don't know. Every few years, a new wave comes along. We, we talk about the moonlights of this world, the get outs. You know, I'm particularly excited to see what Jordan Peele does next. I'm interested to see what Barry Jenkins does next. Um, but <laughs> are, are we talking about reinscribing old languages or is something genuinely, genuinely generative happening whereby it's not just the people making the work, um, but it's the people greenlighting the work. And then we end up talking about standard debates about institutional diversity, which I don't really want to go into, but these are the stakes, I think, that are relevant to what you're talking about. But I think that the art world has become this place where, you know, if you don't want to make a hundred, or if you don't feel you're ever going to get to make a hundred million dollar feature film, that you can go and do something else that is a little bit more off the wall. And since the mid 90s, when art institutions began to collect moving image in an entirely different way, right? Because when we, when we got out of school, if you saw a film in a museum, it was in a theater like this on one night, <laughs> right? Like at MoMA or something. But there wasn't, there were no screens in inside the galleries. And I remember that moment in the 90s that suddenly I start walking into museums and galleries and seeing Diana Fader projections and Douglas Gordon projections all over the place. And so that world became receptive to, and because going to galleries is free and very often for students, going to museums is almost free, if not completely free, you know, the, the Chelsea and museums have become this place where young people can go look at experimental moving images. And they're looking at what John Acompra makes and what many other people make, and that's become the place to do that. When I was 25, it was the Collective for Living Cinema or Anthology Film mm -hmm. Archives or Millennium, 
and they're not there anymore. I think anthology is, but yes. with different kind of <laughs> programming. But the rest of it is is gone. So you know, the, there it, it's not all about uh, you know making the next blockbuster and winning an an Oscar. There is this other world now that is much more elaborate and um, sophisticated than it once uh, than it once was, and much more accepting. And I think that within that. What's happened with Shauna Confra is similar to what happened with Haroon Faroqi and with Chantal Ackerman, that these auteurs from an earlier generation have a greater mastery of the technology and of the history of the moving image. And so when they come into the art world, they come with that arsenal of knowledge that kids from art school who are just picking up an iPhone don't have. And, you know, and, the, and the power of their understanding of the materiality of the medium and the history of the medium shows in the moving images that they put in a museum that are far more worked through and finely tuned than what you know people without any kind of you know I, I teach video sometimes to art students and they really believe that all you have to do is turn on the camera <laughs> <laughs> if it were only that easy <laughs> right thank you. Uh, so that speaks to your point about legacy as well. We'll go to Alex. You should wait for the mic. There was a there was a break because I wanted to think about collectives some more. This mm -hmm. th that had been going on for a while. You know, what is there another collective? Yes, the the eighties and early nineties was a period of collectivity. We can name them across identity based film theoretical political projects. The question is, is that legacy? You how do we think about collectives now? What do we? How do we learn from? collective filmmaking in that moment. Are there collectives working in a similar way now? No, yes. I think that your, the, the question about, um, or your point about a riot and protest, and um, in this moment, um, how we come together because of Twitter. You know, I think these things are right, the state of labor, the state of um, social media, and our potential to collectively produce art. I'm interested in you thinking about that legacy now. I actually think this relates back to uh, the question of Arthur Jaffa a little bit, because the recent piece that became very popular and was widely shared online, it was written up many times, including by me, was uh, Love is the Message, the Message is Death, which I actually think relates not indirectly to The Last Angel of History insofar as it's about confronting blackness as cultural material that applies itself to new technologies. Um, and one of the things that Jaffa teases out is that that new technology is capable of doing a lot of things. It means that it can reproduce cultural objects at a previously unforeseeable velocity. It also means that things can be shared and altered and distributed and in some ways distorted. But it also means that we can capture traumatic images or, polit or political images or upsetting, polarizing images. And all of those affects are just fed into this distributive machinery, which does create a new kind of collectivity. I don't know how directly that applies to art making now. I assume that there are many people working very hard on very many press releases who are trying to come to a much more succinct answer to that question. But definitely, no, but seriously, I mean, it, it, what, it, what I have just described is something that we are all always thinking about and that the art world necessarily has to try to address if it's going to speak to us at all. But the question that new technologies pose for the constitution, reconstitution of collectivities is something that we're all seemingly trying to feel our way through at the moment. Thank you, Toby. Anybody else on the panel? Well, on the collective thing, I mean, I think it's, you know, there are, m critical art ensemble came much later and, you know, sustained itself for quite a while. Um, there are some more recent formations of collectives and groups. I think about, you know, like BFA, MFA, the group that does all this kind of research on exploitation of artists and adjuncts. and. So there are, and Occupy, in a way, is a collective, <laughs> you know, Occupy Museums, Occupy Labor. Or the, so there, there are, you know, expressions of collectivity. Filmmaking is a collective practice. No matter what people say it is, you can't do it by yourself. So 
you know, whether you want to acknowledge that or not, as a maker, is your business for some people, the more top-down triangular model of I'm the boss and I just hire you works, and for other people, it's a, it's a more kind of um, cooperative relationship with those who you bring together, right? But, you know, it's, there's a whole kind of um, self-consciousness about organizing as a collective that I think comes out of a left kind of uh, a leftist way of thinking of things. And I don't know how, I think a lot of young artists are attracted to that and then get more caught up in the individuality thing because the art world kind of pushes you in that direction as, do, as does commercial film to kind of make yourself the, the owner of everything. Um, I think before we wrap, we have time for just one more question. So. Not really a question, but I was thinking as far as collectives in the United States, um, and I'm learning, I'm learning a lot as we go along, but I was thinking of the video freaks, polit our more politi politically uh, uh, situated, and um, maybe Paper Tiger. I think that's a collective, I'm not sure, but it seems to relate to the political uh, and pedagogical intent of what we're talking about tonight. So this is really in, in response to, to what Alex has said, which is, which is great. Yes, and it is, collectives are really hard to work in. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, as we said, I don't know anyone who worked for 16 years in a collective. It's a long one. So I'll tell you, we, we will have to take one yeah. more question, if you don't mind. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> both of you did, but. Hi, so this was for, um, I kind of wanted Toby to go back to what he said about the collective within like being, I guess sequestered within academia is what you were saying or what was your, I just wanted to hear what you were gonna say. Simply that the work has in many ways an avowedly and openly theoretical bent. Um, and I think that a lot of what continues to interest people is the fact that th these were thinkers that are of continuing relevance. So people still read The Black Atlantic by Paul Gilroy. People still read The Location of Culture by Homi Baba. And in Twilight City, which is made in 1989, you see them talking about their childhoods um, and their experiences of London and how that changed over time. Um, and so I do think that there is, I guess, the very active sense of a lived intellectual community that I think continues to appeal for that reason. Thank you, and I just wanna say thank you all for your fantastic questions tonight, and thank you to Toby, Cara, and Coco for your contributions. That's all for tonight. Thank you.